Hi, I'm Mark Ciaffardini with Go See Talk. I'm here with Derek Ciafrance for Place Beyond the Pines. Thank you very much for coming to Dallas. Thanks for having me. Um, this story is personal to you. It's about legacies, whether we want them or not, and about how sometimes life makes choices for us. Uh, it's kind of timeless. So can you tell us about, you know, the, how, how personal and what this means to you? Yeah, I started writing this movie back in 2007 um, when my wife was pregnant with our second son, and I was thinking all about legacy. I was thinking about all the things that I was born with and all the things that I was going to pass on to my child. And you know, honestly, not feeling worthy as a as to, you know to be a, to be a father. You know, feeling like uh, you know I'd done so many things in my life that I wasn't proud of, and here was this baby that was going to come into the world that was going to be uh, pure. You know what I mean? And, and clean. And I just didn't want to stain him with my sins. And, uh, and it felt like, uh, you know, something uh, tangible, something, you know, something that I could really, you know, feel close to to make a movie about. You know, mm -hmm. I, I try. I'm not a natural writer. I'm a you know, filmmaker. Like, I feel like that's, you know, to be on set is kind of like my, you know, what I was born to do. But to write is a little bit more difficult for me. So when I write, I just write uh, things that are personal to me. I write uh, all of my vulnerabilities on the page and, and, and put those on the screen. You know, when I write that way, it's kind of like a challenge to actors. I think that's why I've been able to get, uh, you know, the quality of actors I've been able to get in my movies is because, you know, when I put it on the page, I put it all out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like a diary. It's almost exposed. Well, you talk, uh, your background comes from documentary films, yeah. and the film Blue Valentine and, um, and Pines feels like a documentary in uh, its structure and its shooting style. Can you talk about how that developed, you know, how you got your style from that? Yeah, I had made my first student feature when I was 20, finished it when I was 23. It's called Brother Tide. It was all about brothers, and it was, uh, you know, half of the movie was shot in slow motion. It was... Uh, you know, very formalist, very much about my control over the film. And the film didn't do anything, you know what I mean? I, I spent like 12, it took 12 years to make Blue Valentine after that. And in those 12 years, I started making documentaries just to, you know, put food on the table, just to practice, just to mm -hmm. keep going as a filmmaker. And I quickly learned in documentaries that my, the control I had was different than it was in narratives. And I was no, it was no longer about me. I, I was telling stories about other people. And I kind of felt humbled as a filmmaker. And I had this idea of the filmmaker, which I think a lot of us do, which is this archetypal image of Cecil B. DeMille holding the bullhorn and shouting, you know, and pointing. Mm -hmm. That's the image of a director. But in documentary film, uh, that wasn't the image anymore. This bullhorn now was turned to my ear. It was like a way to funnel in the world, a way to listen. And so making documentary films, I, I learned to listen. I learned to follow moments. I learned, uh, you know, in a documentary film, when something happens, you can't have a take two. You know, you, you can't uh, have anyone do it again. You have to be sharp enough to get it at the moment. When you're interviewing someone in a documentary, they may not answer the question the way you thought they would. And so you have to really listen and be on your toes and be able to uh, go for a ride with them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You have to steer it a little bit, but you also have to be in the passenger seat a little bit. Um, and so, you know, that kind of thrill, that kind of adrenaline rush I got from making documentaries, I wanted to put into, into narratives. And so, you know, with Blue Valentine, I had written 66 drafts of that script. By the time I shot that film, I had uh, 1,224 storyboards. And when I got on set for the first day, I threw, I threw it away. I threw it all away because I wanted it to be alive. And that's, you know, the, the crucial thing for me in movies is that as an audience member, I feel that what, what is up on the screen is actually living, breathing cinema. And that there's actually risk and danger and surprise up on that screen and failure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's beautifully shot. I'm a big fan of Sean Bobbitt's from mm -hmm. McQueen's Hunger and Shame. Yeah. Um, can you talk about where your vision from the film ends and where his job as a cinematographer begins? Uh, yeah, I mean, Sean, you know, I was originally going to shoot this with Andre Perec, who shot uh, Blue Valentine. And Andre called me about eight weeks before we started shooting and told me that he had dreamed he died making the movie. I think he was scared of all the motorcycles or something. And uh, so I was really bummed out, so I went out to find other DPs, and I met with a number of people, and uh, I met with Sean... And, you know, I, I don't want to seem like so emotional or whatever, but I, 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 was, I started to cry when I was talking to Sean because I felt like we had this, such a similar 
reference point. The way he was talking about photography, you know, he, his background was in war photography. His background was in, you know, also taking, you know, these, you know, kind of amazing compositions. The way he would follow people, he had talked about how he would physically engage with them. It was just so on point with the way I was thinking that I thought we could make, a, you know, a beautiful marriage, you know, on in the film. And, you know, it gives Sean, you know, his composition is, and his lighting, um, and his sense of soul in photography is, you know, you know, I think he's one of the greats. So, you know, all of the pictures in the movie are Sean's. And, and, and you know, as just a film fan, I love sitting and watching it because, you know, the images are so beautiful, so soulful. They aren't just beautiful. There's a soul to them, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, he makes even the grit look beautiful, so yeah, yeah. great choice. Yeah. When I was watching this, I got the feel, it kind of reminded me of Akira Kurosawa's High and Low, which mm. is, I call it a half movie, because after about halfway, you don't see Toshiro Mifune anymore. Yeah. Um, it continues on. And this, you described this movie as a triptych. Yeah. Now, um, what about that shooting style, what about that narrative structure was important for you to make it this way, and what kind of difficulties did that present? Um... Yeah, I wanted to, you know, it was always, you know, based around this triptych and, um, you know, I'm interested in movies that have, you know, where characters have choice and that there's real consequences for their choice. Um, you know, the first third of this movie is all about Luke, Ryan Gosling's character and these choices he makes that lead him up to this kind of dramatic turn in the film. And I wanted that turn to have a real effect, you know. I've uh, I've never been a big fan of guns in movies. I feel like it's it's you know I feel like some filmmakers have become so lazy with with this proliferation of violence and guns on the screen. It's like it's like enough already, you know. It's it's I don't know when all of a sudden violence became the thing that's so cinematic, you know. But this fetishizing of violence and slow motion violence and bullets cracking through skulls like I'm, I'm like I'm not so interested I don't think it's beautiful do you know what I mean I don't think it's interesting I don't think it's cool um you know I love I love Sam Peckinpah's films I think that must be where it all comes from this kind of ballet of violence but I felt like when Peckinpah was doing his violence I felt like he was writhing in the fire with the people who were in those you know in the wild bunch I feel like he's one of those guys and you can feel his soul there and, uh, you know, I, I'm just not into violence as a cool thing. And so I wanted, you know, any violence in this movie to be not about how, how much I could fetishize it or how much I could make it viscous or, you know, ultra real looking, you know what I mean, to make you feel it in the pit of your stomach. I wanted it to be narrative violence. I wanted it to be violence in the story that characters make decisions and their lives become violent and that there's an actual reverberation of that violence. And then uh, there's an actual reverberation throughout generations as there would be in real life. And the audience has to sit in the theater and experience that. And that's, uh, you know, to me, that's my responsibility as a filmmaker is to try to see things in a real way and, and give, you know, and, and, uh, and really affect people, you know. But, it, but it's very difficult. Okay. It's very difficult to do. A lot of people called early on with the script to maybe, why don't you intercut the script or something, you know. Uh, but I felt like I had already done that with Blue Valentine, you know. And I'd seen it done so many times. to great effect throughout film history, you know, whether it's Inaritu or Tarantino or Coppola or, uh, you know, D.W. Griffith. You know, the cross-cut sto uh, parallel storytelling is is a great tool in cinema. I love it. Um, but for this one, this movie's about lineage, and so I felt like it needed to be linear. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't think we could have the sanctity of a flashback to make it, you know, to mean to even anything out. I thought you had to experience this movie as the characters experienced it. That's perfect. Well yeah. said. Well, between the casting, the directing, everything was fantastic, and... Uh, just a perfect ending. So congratulations, mm. Derek. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.